Okay, so uh, it's our great pleasure to have uh, Professor Pavel Eisenhoff from uh, MIT to uh, talk at our seminar uh, today. Uh, Professor Eisenhoff uh, has uh, done very influential work uh, in many areas of uh, mathematics, including Lie theory, alpha algebras, and uh, tensor categories, just to name a few. So he's a fellow of the AMS and fellow of the uh, American Academy of Art and Science. And he has uh, received many other honors, including an uh, invited speaker at the ICM. So it's uh, really our great honor to have uh, Professor Ettingoff to give his talk to. Uh, so Professor Ettingoff, please. Yes, thank you. Actually, my uh, talk at the ICM was uh, in Beijing uh, more yes. than 20 years ago, and that was a very nice visit. Mm -hmm. Of course, Beijing now is completely different than then. Yeah. <laughs> But we still hope you, you have um, more chances to come to Beijing to visit us. <laughs> yes, in the hopefully. Okay, so uh, I will talk about uh, uh, my joint work with uh, Kevin Coulombier and Victor Ostrich, which is uh, uh, this paper here, and uh, it's uh, coming out in the Annals of Mathematics. So, uh, so this will be a. Uh, I will start with the uh, classical applications of our result, and then explain. Uh, so basically, a result uh, we were able to prove some uh, result uh, in the representation theory of finite groups, uh, which was out of reach before. And um, I'll explain how we what the result is and how we proved it, and uh, how one can use tensor categories to do so. So, uh, so let's start from a classical setup. So G is going to be a finite group and the P is going to be a prime number. Uh, we're gonna talk about representations of this group over a field of characteristic P. Uh, and uh, so the interesting case will be the modular case when P divides the order of the group. This is the situation where the category of representations are is not semi-simple. So representations aren't semi-simple, aren't completely reducible. And um, we'll take a finite dimensional representation V of this group over some algebraically closed field K of characteristic P. And then I can define a certain, uh, yeah, I can attach to this V a certain combinatorial invariant in the following way. So I will uh, uh, consider the tensor power V to the N uh, and uh, I will be interested in the number of, uh, so, so the uh, Krull-Schmidt theorem implies that this uh, tensor power can be decomposed uh, into a direct sum of indecomposable representations in a unique way. And um, I'm interested in the number of summons, but I'm only going to count summons of dimension co prime to P. So it turns out that, uh, in general, it's interesting to have the total number of, you know, say something about the total number of summons or the total number of summons which are not projective. Uh, but unfortunately, we cannot say much about those numbers. So I'm going to throw away the summons of dimension divisible by P and keep only those which have dimension co prime to P and look at the number of summons with multiplicities. Now, uh, one, uh, it is clear that this uh, sequence of numbers satisfies the following inequality. The dn plus m of v is greater than or equal than uh, dn of v times dm of v. Well, this is simply because uh, v to the n plus m is the tensor product of v to the n and v to the m. And if I have a, a summoned in v to the n of dimension co prime to p and a summoned in v to the m, of dimension co prime to p, let us call them x and y, then x tensor y also has dimension co prime to p. And so it must have a summand of dimension co prime to p. And that summand will occur in v to the m times v to the n. And so that proves this inequality. So it's basically very easy. And another thing is that uh, clearly dn of v is uh, at most dimension of v to the n. Because clearly, uh, every uh, indecomposable summit has dimension at least one. And the total dimension is dimension of V to the N. 
Now, there is a, a simple uh, fact from uh, elementary analysis, which is a good exercise for students uh, studying uh, analysis. And uh, it's uh, the following, that if you have a sequence AN uh, of positive numbers, which satisfies this inequality, uh, so this means that it's uh, uh, super multiplicative, and uh, at the same time, this sequence is bounded above by a geometric progression. Uh, then um, root of degree n of a n has a limit, which is a positive real number. Uh, and uh, and so this uh, so so we can define therefore. Uh, uh, what we call the growth dimension, D of V, uh, which is the limit when n goes to infinity, dn of V to the power one over n. So if uh, uh, it, uh, it's a fact that uh, if you tensor a representation in decomposable representation, we will see this later, that if you take an indecomposable representation of dimension divisible by P, well, such representations form a tensor ideal in the sense that if you tensor it with any representation, then all indecomposable summons will have dimension divisible by P. And for this reason, uh, if we start with a representation whose all summons uh, uh, have dimension divisible by P, then that will be also true for any tensor power and uh, so uh, the number dn of v will be zero for all n. So this limit is going to be zero. But uh, apart from that, uh, all these numbers dn of v uh, are going. So if you have at least one summon of dimension non divisible by p in v, then that will be also the case for v to the n. So these numbers are at least one. And uh, so you will get. Uh, a strictly positive number, which is at least one. So here are some uh, obvious properties. So one property is uh, that uh, D of direct sum is greater or equal than D of the summons, sum of uh, D of V plus W greater or equal than D of V plus D of W. So that's easy to show. So I'm not going to explain this because it's, it's an easy exercise. Also, D of V tensor W is D of V, at least D of V, D of W. Uh, like I said, dimension is zero. D of V is zero if and only if all indecomposable summons are divisible by P. So such representations will be called negligible. And as I said, they form a tensor ideal. And also, if D of X is bigger than zero, so away from this case, it is at least one and at most dimension. And uh, actually, uh, from elementary considerations, one cannot uh, say much more than this. For example, it is not clear what kind of numbers this D of V can be. A priori, it's a real number, at least one, when it is not zero. But is it an algebraic number? Is it transcendental? Uh, what properties does it have? All of that isn't completely, is, isn't clear at all from the elementary point of view. However, it turns out that using the theory of tensor categories, you can actually say a lot more. And this is the main theorem. So uh, uh, it says that this uh, function D uh, extends to a character of the split Grotten-Dieckring of representations. Uh, namely, uh, it's the same thing as the green ring. So uh, green ring of uh, the category is by definition, a ring uh, in which uh, a basis is formed by classes of indecomposables, and uh, the product is uh, determined by the tensor product. So you tensor two indecomposables, and you decompose them in a direct sum of indecomposables. And uh, so this, uh, in, in uh, down-to-earth terms, this means that, in fact, those two inequalities that we claimed here are equalities. So D of V plus W is equal to D of V plus D of W and D of uh, V tensor W is D of V times D of W. 
So, it, so it's a ring homomorphism. And another thing is it tells us exactly what numbers can occur uh, as these dimensions, D of V, growth dimensions. So they are all algebraic of very specific kind. So namely, uh, let Q be e to the pi i over P, where P is our prime. So that's a root of unity. And uh, then we have the notion of Q analog of a number M. And this is Q to the M minus Q to the minus M over Q minus Q inverse, which is Q to the M minus one plus so on plus Q to the one minus M. So this is, uh, so Q to the one minus M minus three plus so on plus Q to one minus M. So this is a Q number. And uh, so these are complex numbers, real numbers, in fact. Uh, and uh, then for every X in our representation category, uh, this D of X is in fact a linear combination of those Q numbers uh, with non-negative integer coefficient. And I can take uh, one less than or equal to M less than or equal to P over two, because uh, the Q number MQ is the same as P minus MQ. So uh, they're symmetrical and so, uh, these numbers are sufficient. And so with non-negative integer coefficient. So in particular, it says that uh, uh, for P equal two and three, uh, well, if P equal uh, two and three, this means that M is one. And so the Q number is also one. So this means that this D of X is always an integer. But for P equal five, it says uh, that, uh, that it can be, uh, uh, it's it's an integer plus uh, another integer times the golden ratio one plus square root of five over two, which is the Q analog of two in uh, for for Q equal to e to the pi i over five. And in fact, uh, those irrational dimensions do occur for for p equal five. We can see that uh, easily from the following example, the simplest uh, example. Uh, so the simplest case is uh, G equal to Z mod five. It's a the simplest example of a group whose order is divisible by five. And then uh, in decomposable representations of this group correspond to Jordan blocks uh, of sizes one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and um, let's take the three dimensional in decomposable representation. So this is a representation which sends an element one uh, of F5 or Z mod five, which is generator to the matrix uh, here. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, you can raise it to power N and it is easy to see that, uh, well, if you tensor J3, if you tensor odd dimensional Jordan blocks, you only can get odd dimensional Jordan blocks. So you're gonna get a n times j one plus b n times j three plus c n times j five, and then uh, we have these uh, tensor product rules that v tensor j one equals to j three because v is j three v times j three is j one plus j three plus j five, and v times j five actually is three copies of j five. So you can check that the first two uh, rules are the same as in characteristic zero, but the third one uh, in characteristic zero, you would get uh, for Jordan blocks, uh, you would get J3 plus uh, J5 plus J7, like representations of SL2, but in characteristic P, you uh, you get just three J5 because you don't get, don't have any, in fact, the characteristic P don't have any blocks bigger than J5. And uh, using these rules, you can uh, write down the following recursive uh, equations uh, that a n plus one equals to b n, b n plus one equals to a n plus b n. And uh, this implies that b n plus one equals to b n plus b n minus one. And that's a Fibonacci recursion. Uh, and we know that the Fibonacci numbers uh, grow. Uh, so, so when we compute, uh, our D, uh, so DN uh, of V uh, is uh, just AN plus BN, which is the same as uh, uh, BN plus one. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, we know that Fibonacci numbers uh, grow like uh, one plus root of five over two to the n. So this implies that in this case, d of v is uh, the golden ratio, uh, one plus square root of five over two, which is the q analog of two. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, in characteristic five, like I said, you will have this kind of thing. So, um, so that's uh, the theorem. And uh, I should mention that, uh, that in fact it holds more generally, I said for finite groups, but it actually holds for arbitrary groups and then for Lie algebras. And in fact, more generally for, uh, for any uh, affine uh, group or supergroup scheme uh, over uh, uh, K. So that's the classical result that we were able to prove. And uh, uh, are there any questions up to this point? So I will explain how tensor categories can be used to prove this. But before that, are there any questions? Oh, it seems so. Mm -hmm. No, there, there's, there, there's no question so far. Oh, okay, so now we pass to less elementary uh, part. Uh, so I need to explain how to prove this theorem. And the proof is based on the theory of tensor categories. So I will have to recall some uh, basics. So, uh, so what is a symmetric tensor category? So it's a, it's, a, it's a category C. I will not give a complete definition. I will just remind the uh, ingredients. So we have a category C, which has uh, structures uh, and uh, Oops. Oh. Yeah, now, now it's good. Okay. So we have category C, uh, which has uh, basically structures and properties of uh, the category of finite dimensional representations of, uh, of a group. So we want to abstract away the group and only keep the properties of the category. So it's going to be, first of all, a k-linear abelian category, where k is our algebraically closed field. So this means that objects, uh, that morphisms uh, between uh, objects x and y uh, form a vector space over k, and uh, composition uh, of morphisms is bilinear. And abelian means that we have uh, kernels, co-kernels, and images. Uh, of morphisms, basically, also zero direct sums and so on. We want it to be Artinian, which means that objects have finite length and uh, forms a finite dimensional vector spaces. So every object, uh, so in such a category, we have uh, Jordan Holder theorem that there is a unique composition series uh, of every object and uh, Krull Schmidt theorem that every object is a uniquely a direct sum of indecomposables. So those are additive structures. And then uh, we want uh, multiplicative structures. So we want the category to be monoidal, which means we have a tensor product functor uh, uh, and we have uh, an associativity isomorphism. So it's an associative tensor product. Also the unit object with an appropriate uh, set of axioms, most importantly, the pentagon relation. Now we want the category to be symmetric, which means that there is a, a map from X tensor Y to Y tensor X, which is functorial in X and Y, and which squares to the identity, and uh, which satisfies uh, uh, hexagon axioms, which I didn't write here. Also, we want it to be rigid, which means that every object has a dual with appropriate rigidity axioms. Uh, so this is the multiplicative structure. And then uh, we have to require some kind of distributivity, uh, which is compatibility between additive and multiplicative structures. And this is just a condition that the tensor product is bilinear on morphisms. And finally, there is a mild condition that endomorphisms of the unit is uh, K. In fact, uh, if you don't impose this condition, all you get is direct sums of such things when endomorphisms of one is a finite direct sum 
of copies of K. So this is last condition is not really restrictive at all. And uh, of course, uh, since this was obtained by abstracting away the uh, properties and structures of the category of representations of a group, uh, this is the, the main example. Uh, if G is a group, uh, then uh, the category of representations uh, of this group uh, over K finite dimensional representations is a symmetric tensor category. For example, uh, if the group is trivial, then we get uh, the simplest example of a symmetric tensor category, which is the category of finite dimensional vector spaces over K. And more generally, we can take any uh, affine group scheme, uh, which means that we have a commutative Hopf algebra and we take co-modules over this Hopf algebra. So representations of uh, an affine group scheme. Then there is another example, which is not of this kind, which is the category of super vector spaces. And uh, this uh, is denoted by Svek K. And this, uh, this is defined when characteristic of K is not equal to two. So this is the category of uh, uh, vector spaces graded by Z mod two. So it's a Z spaces which have the form V zero plus V one. Uh, or equivalently, you can say that these are representations of Z mod two because our characteristic is not two, so it's the same thing. But, and the only difference is that the um, symmetry uh, structure, uh, instead of the usual flip, which sends X tensor Y to Y tensor X, it sends X tensor Y to minus one, to the degree of x times degree of y, y tensor x, if x and y are homogeneous. So this degree is zero if x belongs to v0 and one if it belongs to v1. So the only change really occurs when both elements belong to v1, when they're both odd, in which case uh, the permutation is supplemented by a minus sign. And so this category, one can show it's a nice exercise that this category is not of the previous type. And in fact, uh, this has a generalization. We can consider affine group schemes, but not in the usual sense, but internal to this category. So this means that uh, we can consider commutative Hopf algebras uh, in this category and look at co-modules over those Hopf algebras. In fact, we can do something slightly more general. Namely, if uh, your uh, group scheme, uh, a fine group scheme G, so you can think of, uh, if you have a Hopf al uh, algebra O of G, uh, you can think of uh, this super group scheme as a, as a functor of points, Grothendieck functor of points. So it attaches to every commutative algebra in this category, a group. In particular, we can talk about points of G over K, which are just homomorphisms from this Hopf algebra to the trivial object, to the, to the unit object equipped with the trivial algebra structure. Uh, and so this is an ordinary group. And uh, suppose we have an element there, which squares to the identity and which acts so such an element would act by an involution on O of G by conjugation. And uh, suppose that it, it coincides with the parity operator. This will be called then a parity element. Such an element doesn't always exist, but if it doesn't, then we can adjoin it formally and obtain a slightly larger group where this element is present. And then you can consider the category of representations of G rep G comma Z. So these are representations on which uh, Z acts by the parity operator. So remember that the representation of G is a super vector space. So in particular, it has a parity operator that acts by one on V zero and by minus one on V one. And uh, so we want the Z to act by parity operator. So that's uh, the, actually, this is the most general thing you can make out of super groups. And uh, so one says that, the, um, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, these examples can be uh, 
characterized uh, by uh, by purely categorical properties. Uh, uh, so uh, we say that the symmetric tensor category is Tanakian if uh, it has a so-called uh, fiber functor, which is a symmetric tensor functor to the category of vector spaces. So what is symmetric tensor functor? It's just a, a functor that preserves tensor product. And uh, in the category world, that means that it's equipped with a structure called tensor structure that uh, identify f of x tensor f of y with f of x tensor y, and which satisfies some compatibility with uh, associativity morphism. And uh, so uh, Tanakian category is the category uh, which has such a functor. And in this case, uh, it was proved by Delin and Milne that uh, <laughs> this functor is unique. That's not so hard to show. And moreover, we can uh, define a, a fine group scheme, uh, which is uh, the group scheme of automorphisms of this functor, which preserves uh, the tensor structure. So tensor automorphisms of this functor. And, and then uh, the category C is reconstructed as the representation category of this affine group scheme. In other words, a Tanakian category is the same thing as the category of representations of an affine group scheme. And this group scheme is uniquely determined by this category up to conjugation through this procedure, which is called Tanakian reconstruction or Tanakian format. And now there is a similar story for uh, the supergroups. Namely, we call a category super Tanakian when characteristic is not two. If there exists a fiber functor to, uh, from this category to the category of super vector spaces. So that's a, again, a symmetric tensor functor. So it's uh, supposed to be uh, monoidal. So, so tensor functor means that it's preserves tensor product and it's supposed to be exact also. So, uh, so that's what we mean by fiber functor. Uh, Maybe I should mention that it is supposed to be exact. Exact symmetric tensor functor. Uh, and uh, in this case, you can also show that it is unique. So this was also done by Deline. And you can consider the group of tensor automorphisms of F. That's an, now a supergroup scheme, a fine supergroup scheme over K. And it has a parity. Uh, this supergroup has a distinguished element Z, uh, which is a, uh, uh, well, it, it's an automorphism of F, which ends, acts on every super vector space F of X by the parity operator. And uh, so that gives us distinguished element of this group. And uh, we can look at the category of representations. This element acts on the group by parity, that's easy to check. And uh, we uh, can consider representation category of this group with this element acting by parity. And this recovers category C. So every category C with such a fiber functor is as this form and vice versa. And moreover, if I give you C, then you can recover this pair GZ up to uniquely up to conjugation. And uh, one may ask if uh, these are all the examples one can come up with. And uh, mm, well, uh, so not quite. There is another condition that these categories satisfy and a general category doesn't, uh, namely, this definition is also due to Deline. So uh, uh, a symmetric tensor category C uh, is said to have moderate growth if uh, every object X in C, uh, so admits a, a positive number CX. 
such that uh, the length of the composition series of x to the n is uh, dominated by this constant cx to the power n. So the length, if the length of x to the n grows at most exponentially. In fact, it cannot grow usually more slowly than exponentially, but at most exponentially. And so uh, if you have representation category, then uh, such cx obviously exists. You can simply take the dimension of x over your field. So this category is of moderate growth, but there are some categories that have faster growth, the so-called Deline categories, rep GLT, which are obtained by interpolation of representation category of the general linear group to non-integer values of T. And there are some similar categories for symmetric group and so on, and they don't have moderate growth. And they are therefore not of this group. But let's, uh, let's uh, disallow such categories and focus only on categories of moderate growth. So we may ask if there are any new examples. And in characteristic zero, the answer is no. And uh, this is the celebrated theorem of Deligne, which says that from 2002, which says that a symmetric tensor category over uh, K of characteristic zero is super Tanakian, if and only if it is of moderate growth. So of course, one implication is trivial, a super Tanakian category does have moderate growth for trivial reason, but the converse implication, this implication is pretty deep and that's the content of the main theorem. Now, this theorem fails in characteristic P. And uh, it is the failure of this theorem that uh, somehow leads to those irrational numbers, uh, D of V that we have discussed. And uh, so in fact, uh, it fails, but we can, uh, but it can be corrected. And the, this way to correct this theorem, uh, has to do with the, how we prove this classical results about growth uh, of uh, tensor powers. I should mention that in characteristic two, when I talk about super Tanakian categories, I really will mean Tanakian because in characteristic two, we don't have signs and there is no difference between super Tanakian and Tanakian. So, so now I will explain how uh, this theorem fails in characteristic P and how it could be fixed and how this uh, can be used to prove our main theorem. So any questions up to this point? No, so far so good. All right, so, uh, so to show that, uh, give a counter example to uh, Deligne's theorem in characteristic P, we need uh, the notion of semi-simplification, which will also be used uh, for uh, proving our main result. So semi-simplification of a symmetric tensor category. Uh, so in fact, uh, we don't need uh, to work with abelian categories. We can, uh, consider just additive rigid symmetric monoidal categories. We, are, we don't necessarily have kernels, co-kernels and images. We only have, uh, well, we can take a Carubian completion, which means we can just uh, adjoin images of split morphisms. Uh, so suppose in the morphisms of one equals to K. So in this situation, whenever you have a morphism from X to itself for some object X, then uh, we can define the trace of this object, of this morphism, which is a number in our ground field. And this is done in the following way. So uh, re recall that uh, I assume that my category is rigid, which means it has functor of dualization, X goes to X star. And this uh, comes with a uh, uh, so-called evaluation and co-evaluation morphism. So there is a 
map from one to X tensor X dual, which is called co-evaluation. And we have also a map from X dual tensor X to one, which is called evaluation. And uh, if uh, we are in the category of vector spaces, these are the usual canonical maps. Now, if you have a morphism from X to itself, then you can tensor it with the identity morphism and get a morphism from X tensor X dual to X tensor X dual. And then we can uh, post compose it with C, which is the permutation morphism, the symmetry morphism from X tensor X dual to X dual tensor X. And so we can take this composition, which is a morphism from the unit to itself. And we assume that the map from the unit to itself is the field K. So the composition is going to be a number, which is called the trace of F. And in particular, we can define the dimension of X. This is different from the previous uh, kind of growth dimension that's called categorical dimension. And that's a, an element that's not a real number, but it's an element of our ground field. Uh, and this is defined to be the trace of the identity morphism of X. And so uh, we define, uh, uh, so, so, so now we need an important notion of negligible morphism. So a morphism between two objects X and Y is called negligible. If uh, for every morphism G, the other way from Y to X, trace of the composition is zero. By the way, it is easy to see the trace of composition FG coincides with the trace of GF so uh, it doesn't matter in what order we write them. And uh, the first uh, important lemma uh, is that such morphisms uh, form what is called a tensor ideal. It's not the, so I talked already about tensor ideals formed by negligible representations. So that's what is called thick tensor ideal, which means it's defined by a set of objects. But this is a more general notion of tensor ideal. It's a tensor ideal of morphisms. And uh, by this, I mean that for every object X and Y, in the space of morphisms from X to Y, we have a subspace N of X, Y. And uh, so it's a system of subspaces and it is supposed to be closed under composition and under tensor product with any morphism. Composition with any morphism and tensor product of any, with any morphism. So that's what is a tensor ideal. And uh, the first lemma is that negligible morphisms form a tensor ideal. So I will not prove this lemma. It is a kind of straightforward verification. Uh, and so the next uh, lemma is the following, that uh, uh, let me assume that uh, every nilpotent endomorphism in C has zero trace. This is not necessarily true. This may fail, and maybe we will see an example, but uh, it is definitely true for, uh, for any uh, symmetric tensor category, which is abelian. Because in that case, you can, for such a dimorphism, take a filtration by kernels of its powers. And it is strictly upper triangular with respect to this filtration. So the trace, which only, count, which only depends on the diagonal uh, part, is zero. And um, more generally, if C admits a monoidal functor into an abelian symmetric tensor category, it, then it is still true because trace uh, commutes uh, with uh, monoidal functors and uh, can be computed after applying this functor. So suppose we have this property, trace zero property, and then the lemma says that uh, uh, the quotient C mod N, which we call C bar, uh, is a semi-simple symmetric tensor category. So what do we mean by this quotient C bar? The objects 
are the same as those of C, but morphisms whom in C bar from X to Y is the morphisms in the old category from C from X to Y modulo this subspace N of X, Y. So you can define such a quotient for any tensor ideal, but the claim is that when we have this uh, trace zero condition, then uh, the resulting uh, category will be a symmetric tensor category, an abelian one, and moreover, a semi-simple one, which means that it will have complete reducibility. And uh, the next lemma, which was proved many years ago by Benson in the setting of modular representations, uh, is uh, gives an explicit description of uh, of this category C bar, which in particular allows us to see that it is semi uh, So, uh, so. So under the assumption of zero trace, uh, the following hold. First of all, part one is a characterization of negligible morphisms between indecomposable objects, X and Y. Actually, it's easier to say what it means for it to be non-negligible. So it says that it's equivalent to being an isomorphism and dimension of X, categorical dimension of X, not zero. So F is not negligible if and only if it's an isomorphism and dimension of X is not zero. Uh, so basically, what does this thing say? So, uh, so, so if X and Y are not isomorphic, then every morphism between them is negligible. And if X and Y are isomorphic, well, we then can assume that Y equals to X. So we have a morphism from X to X. So the ring of morphisms from X to X is a local algebra, local finite dimensional K algebra, which has uh, therefore a maximal ideal M and it is equal to k plus m. And uh, then uh, elements of m are nilpotent and therefore they are always negligible. But the identity morphism which remains may or may not be negligible depending on whether the dimension is zero or not. If the dimension is zero, it is negligible. And if dimension is not zero, it is not. And the second part says that how to tell if a morphism between decomposable, possibly decomposable objects is negligible. And that's if and only if all matrix elements, so if you have an object direct sum of Xi and have a map to direct sum of Yj, uh, with the uh, matrix entries, block matrix n series F i j, then uh, this is negligible if and only if every single block F i j is negligible. So uh, now this category C bar, which we uh, obtained by taking this quotient, is called the semi simplification of C. And uh, we uh, obtain a corollary uh, that. Uh, simple objects of this category C bar are the indecomposables of C of non-zero dimension. So, uh, so what happens? So this is uh, uh, by doing this quotient, we basically force Schur's lemma on our category. So if X and Y are indecomposables, which are not isomorphic, then all morphisms between them become zero in the quotient. So they don't talk to each other. And if they are isomorphic, then, uh, well, the only morphism that will remain is the identity and its multiples, or maybe nothing if the dimension of this object is zero. In that case, all morphisms from X to itself will be zero, including the identity morphism. And that means that this object X will become zero, will die when passing to the 
semi-simplification. So in other words, what happens is in decomposables of C become irreducibles or simples of C bar, but some of them become zero, namely those who had dimension zero. Uh, so I will give an example now. I will take a category C, which is just representations of Z mod P, where K has characteristic P. <laughs> so this means that we have an operator G on our vector space whose P's power is one. And in characteristic P, this equation can be rewritten as G minus one to the P equals zero. So this means that G minus one is a direct sum of Jordan blocks of size one through p. So in decomposables are these Jordan blocks, G, J1, up J2, up to JP. And uh, J1 is the unit object, the trivial representation. Now, when we do semi-simplification, these become simple objects of our category C bar, which is L1 and so on, LP minus one. And JP becomes zero because its dimension is divisible by P. Hence its categorical dimension is zero. So we will have P minus one in decomposables in this semi-simplified category. And then we can compute the tensor product of these Ls, the fusion rule. And that turns out to be the Verlinde rule for SL2. at the root of unity of order 2p. More precisely, the usual klebsch gordon rule, so Jordan blocks and characteristic zero tensor the same way as representations of SL2 by the klebsch gordon rule, which is this rule, but without uh, these terms here. Uh, but when uh, we do this semi-simplification, what happens is that this klebsch gordon rule gets truncated. And instead of minimum mn here, we've got minimum of mn, p minus m, and p minus n. And for this reason, we call this category the Verlinde category, even though it was uh, uh, introduced uh, maybe for <coughs> more general, as a special case of more general construction by Sergei Gelfand and David Kashdan. Uh, in, uh, and uh, independently uh, Georgiev and Mathieu uh, at the beginning of 1990s, about 30 years ago. And I will uh, denote this category by verb P. Now, there is a variant of this construction which is very similar when you replace Z mod P by uh, alpha P, which is the Frobenius kernel of the additive group. And so, uh, so examples, well, ver2 is just the category of vector spaces because it only has the object L1 in decomposable. Ver3 has L1 and L2, and this tensor product rule says that L2 tensor L2 equals to L1. So it looks like it's Z mod two graded vector spaces or representations of Z mod two over a field of characteristic three. But actually one can see easily that the braiding, the permutation morphism on L2 tensor L2 has a minus sign. And so this is the category of super vector spaces over K. In general, this category verb P has two subcategories. One is spanned by odd dimensional Li's and the other is spanned by L1 and LP minus one when P is bigger than two. And uh, where P is just an external tensor product of them. And uh, in particular, VER5 uh, is a product of these two things. And uh, if we take X equals to L3, so VER, 5 plus is spanned by 1 and x, 
and x tensor x uh, equals to one plus x. That's uh, very similar and uh, closely related to the example we already uh, discussed. So if you tensor x many uh, n times with itself and look at the multiplicities, those will be consecutive of one and x. Those will be consecutive Fibonacci numbers, which is why this category ver five plus is called the Fibonacci category. But it's a Fibonacci category in characteristic five. Well, many people consider it's lift to characteristic zero, which arises in many subjects such as conformal field theory, subfactors, quantum computation, and so on. But here we're talking about the reduction of that category modulo five. And uh, that category is symmetric. So th this category doesn't admit a lift. These categories were P, uh, they have the same fusion rules as the categories, uh, the Linda categories arising in conformal field theory, but uh, they are symmetric while uh, the categories uh, in characteristic zero are braided and non-symmetric. So these categories do not have a braided, do not have a symmetric lift to characteristic zero by the Lynch theorem, but uh, they have uh, a lift which is braided. But anyway, I should explain why this category ver five is a counterexample to the Lean theorem and characteristic five. So th this uh, tensor product rule means that if we had a monoidal functor from this category to some to vector space or super vector spaces, then the dimension of the image of X would have to satisfy this equation, d squared equals to d plus one. But there is no integer satisfying this equation. And that proves that this is a, a counterexample to the lean sphere. And in fact, for any p bigger or equal to five, you can have uh, a sim do a similar calculation and show that uh, there is no fiber functor from verb p. So these are genuinely new examples uh, which are not covered by super Tanakian categories. I should mention that the way this category arose in the work of Gelfand and Kajdan and Georgiev and Mathieu was slightly different. They considered instead the category of tilting modules for uh, SL2K and took the, this category is not abelian, but it is, uh, satisfies our condition. Uh, namely, it has a trace zero condition because it's a subcategory of representations of SL2K. And the semi simplification of this category is verb P. So now uh, the question is how can you fix the Lin's theorem? So remember, we started with uh, group representations, and then we had the notion of Tanakian category, which are categories that have a fiber functor to vector spaces, or our category of representations of an affine group scheme. And uh, we uh, could have asked, asked ourselves at that point whether there is anything new, well, let's say with the moderate growth condition. And the answer would be yes, because there would be category of super vector spaces that is not of that type. And once we found that, there are many more examples, which are categories that fiber over that category namely category of representations of affine supergroup schemes or super Tanakian. So now in characteristic zero, there is no more examples as long as you are willing to assume moderate growth. But uh, in characteristic P, we have found a new example, at least when P is greater or equal to five. In fact, such examples exist even, they exist for every P, but we have found them for P greater or equal to five. So since this category doesn't have a fiber functor, maybe we should do the same as we did with super vector spaces, which allowed it as a target for fiber functors. So we consider more general fiber functors, which take values in this category that we weren't able to construct from the previous setting. And so uh, 
and uh, then we can ask if any uh, tensor category, symmetric tensor category of moderate growth over K fibers over verb B. Victor Ostick conjectured that in 2015, and he proved this for fusion categories, which means under the assumption that it has finitely many simple objects and semi-simple. So if you have a, he proved that if you have a fusion category, uh, which has finally many simple objects and is semi-simple, uh, then there exists a fiber functor from C to verb P. That was a remarkable result uh, uh, because in this case, you can consider uh, the group scheme of automorphisms of F of this fiber functor uh, denoted by F. Uh, and that's a, a fine group scheme internal to the category verb P. And uh, our category becomes the category of representations of this G, uh, compatible with the action of fundamental group. So this is a kind of detail that's not so important, so I'm not going to explain. So in other words, uh, study of fusion categories uh, over K, reduces in this way to studying a fine group schemes, in fact, finite group schemes uh, with uh, linearly reductive finite group schemes in verb P. Of course, there is a question of what they look like, and we now have a conjecture about that, but in any case, it makes the problem much more concrete because it reduces to developing Lie theory inside verb P. But then there is a question of what uh, can we say about categories which aren't fusion? Uh, and uh, there is a simple counterexample for finite but non semi simple categories, which comes from the paper of my former student Sidhat Venkatesh. And this is the following we just take uh, Hopfe algebra k of d over d squared. Uh, where uh, characteristic of K is two. Uh, so this is, a, so we have a primitive element D. Uh, so this is just a group algebra of the Frobenius kernel alpha two. That's definitely a Tanakian category, but we can consider a weird symmetric braiding, which is, the composition of the ordinary flip with an R matrix. And the R matrix is going to be one tensor one plus D tensor D. So that's a triangular uh, Hopf algebra. And, and then uh, one can show that the category of modules over this triangular Hopf algebras, <laughs> algebra is a, uh, it, it is not uh, a Tanakian category and it doesn't admit a fiber functor into verb P because verb, verb two is the category of vector space. And uh, in fact, with uh, Benson and Ostrich, we were able to construct counterexamples for every prime, but they're more complicated. So, uh, then you may ask uh, what prevents this category from having a fiber functor to vector spaces, which is the same as verb two. And the answer is it's the Frobenius functor. So uh, if you have a symmetric tensor category in characteristic two, then you can define a remarkable functor in this category, which is called the Frobenius functor. Frobenius twist function. And it's, it's very simple. You take X, you take the tensor product of X with itself. And then uh, we have an endomorphisms one plus P in X tensor X, where P is the permuta is a symmetric uh, braiding. Maybe I should call it C. But I could call it C, I think. This is what I called it before. Uh, 
And, and then uh, C squared is one. So this means that one plus C squared is zero in characteristic two. So we can view it as a differential from X tensor X to itself. And we can take its cohomology, which is the kernel of one plus C modular image of one plus C. So basically uh, you can, uh, this X tensor X has a filtration with three canonical filtration with three pieces. Uh, you have wedge two of X, X one and wedge two of X. And uh, this is the symmetric square. And this is the divided power square. And uh, the mid this middle piece is this Frobenius of X. Because <laughs> the kernel of one plus S is this uh, gamma two X and the image of one plus S is wedge two of X. So the quotient is exactly this X. And then there is an exercise that if you take the regular representation of this Hopf algebra here, and you take its uh, Frobenius functor, then you actually get zero. While Frobenius functor of the trivial object, identity object is always the identity itself. So we have a short exact sequence, zero, one, H, one, zero. But when we apply to this sequence, the Frobenius functor, we obtain a sequence that isn't exact. In fact, it's not left exact or right exact. It's only exact in the middle. So this functor isn't exact on any side. But on the other hand, it's an additive functor. One can show that it preserves direct sum. So on every semi-simple category, it would be exact. And also it commutes with tensor functor. So this means that if we had a functor, fiber functor to vector spaces, we would get a contradiction. So this shows that this, this is an obstruction. Having a non-exact Frobenius functor is an obstruction for C to have a fiber functor to vector spaces or to, uh, and, and there, is a, there is a similar uh, story for arbitrary prime. We take an object. So how do you define Frobenius functor there? You, you take X, you raise it to power P. There is a cyclic permutation acting here. C to the P equals to one. Uh, and uh, then uh, we can view this X to the P as an object of C tensored with representations of Z mod P. And uh, then one can do semi-simplification, which will uh, turn this into verb P. Don't touch the first factor. There is a way to do it so that you don't touch the first factor and only simply semi-simplify this factor. And then you end up in C tensored with verb P. So you get a monoidal functor from C to C cross verb P, which is twisted linear. So it raises scalar to P power. And uh, then this functor can be decomposed into direct sum of objects of verb P with some multiplicity functors. And in fact, these functors can be described uh, in terms of uh, linear algebra. So in terms of filtration of X to the P by kernels of powers of one minus C to the I. So more precisely for I is the kernel of A intersect with the image of A to the I minus one over the kernel of A intersect with image of A to the I, where A is this one minus C. And now the definition says that C is called Frobenius exact if uh, this functor is exact. Uh, and the main theorem uh, that we proved that that's the only obstruction. So if our category is Frobenius exact, then it does have a fiber functor into Verlin the category. And moreover, this functor is unique. So that's a generalization of the Lin theorem to positive characteristic. Unfortunately, it is not yet the whole story because this rules out this, uh, non frobenius exact category, uh, which I uh, explained before in characteristic two. 
uh, and many other interesting examples. But at least in the case when we, our category is Frobenius exact, uh, this is true. And the important uh, special case is when the category is semi-simple. So any semi-simple symmetric tensor category uh, is uh, Frobenius exact by definition and therefore admits a fiber functor into Verpi. This is what Ostrich conjectured in 2015 and we proved six years later. So the proof is quite complicated. It uh, combines the methods of Deligne with the new methods that were developed by our author, Kevin Collin, Coulombier. Uh, and uh, so now I will explain uh, how this can uh, this theorem uh, can be used to prove the classical result that I started my talk with. And that will be the last thing I'll do. Any questions? No, that doesn't seem question. Okay. So let's uh, then explain. So remember the setup. So we have a category of representations of a group G. And so uh, let us take its semi-simplification C bar, which is uh, uh, going to be called, uh, so, so that's a semi-simplification of the representation category of C. And then uh, remember we had this DN of X and DN of X was the number of non-negligible summons in X to the N. Now, what will happen to this when we take semi-simplification? Remember that in decomposables become irreducibles, except those of dimension divisible by P. So this procedure will kill exactly those that we ignored, which are negligible ones, and make the other ones into simple, so irreducibles. So dn of x will simply be length of x bar to the n, where x bar is the image of x in c bar. So I said that the objects don't change, but when I regard x as an object of c bar, I will call it x bar to distinguish. Uh, now, our main theorem says that this category rep k of g bar since it is semi-simple, admits a fiber functor into ver p. In other words, uh, it's a category of representations of some affine group scheme uh, in ver p, which is linearly reductive. Now, uh, we can compute this length before or after the fu functor f. And in fact, uh, they're not the same because functor f of a simple object may decompose and become semi-simple and not simple. <laughs> However, one can show that this length does not increase too much when we do that. In other words, uh, although root of degree n of length of x to the n bar is less than or equal than the root of degree n of length of f of x bar to the n. It is not much less in the sense that uh, they go to the same limit. In other words, the factor by which the length increases when we apply the functor f is a sub exponential function of n. It, it grows slower than any exponential function of n. And as a result, these things have the same limit. And this implies that this D of uh, and some object Y can be computed as the uh, limit of, uh, so, so D of X can be computed as uh, Well, all right, I call it y. Uh, Frobenius, so, so it is the uh, length of the tensor power of f of x bar, where f lands in this Berlinda category. 
but this is a very simple problem because in this category, we have finitely many simple objects and F of X bar just multiplies them by a certain matrix. And uh, then uh, we know, basically we're down to the problem of computing asymptotics of matrix entries of a power of a matrix. And that is governed of course, by the spectral radius of this matrix, which is uh, the, called the frobenius Peron dimension of this uh, F of Y. So we have concluded that this growth dimension of a representation D of Y, which was our mysterious real number is in fact the frobenius Peron dimension of F of uh, Y bar of uh, uh, this thing in the semi-simplification. And in particular, it is uh, already clear that this is an algebraic integer because it's the largest eigenvalue of a matrix with integer entries. But in fact, we can do better than that because uh, we know that uh, this F of uh, Y bar is uh, a direct sum of uh, simple objects Li of our Verlinde category uh, with some multiplicities Mi. And therefore, this D of Y is going to be the sum of Mi times the frobenius Peron dimensions of Li, which are just Q analogs of I. And uh, we get this formula that this is the sum of Mi times IQ, which is exactly the claim that uh, I made at the beginning of the talk. Uh, so any questions? No. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So does this imply that this is a character from the growth on the screen? I'm not quite yes. sure. Yes, exactly. It implies that because uh, for finite uh, for fusion categories, uh, this de growth dimension is a uh, is well known to be a, a character. If you have a fusion ring uh, with finitely many uh, like with finitely many objects, you get matrices, and the largest eigenvalues are additive and multiplicative on those positive matrices. Okay, I, I see. I see. Now, other questions? Can I ask a question about uh, the main theorem? Uh, yes. The main theorem. Do you have to have some kind of special treatment for uh, p equals two and maybe p equals three in, in that proof? Or is it a fairly kind of... Uh, no, no, no you're, there is no special treatment. It is exactly the same proof. And uh, what this shows is that uh, in uh, characteristic two and three, uh, actually uh, the Lean theorem is uh, is true on the nodes for uh, Frobenius exact categories. And uh, the dimensions we get are always integers for that piece. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll finish with a few comments that uh, we, we get a few corollaries from this. Uh, so one corollary is that uh, uh, if you take a representation of a uh, modular representation of a finite group, uh, then uh, we can, uh, well, when you tensor uh, this representation uh, with itself and with its dual, the indecomposable summons can get very large. However, they cannot get very large in the sense of this growth dimension, namely the growth dimension of any summons in such tensor product is bounded by some constant which depends only on X and in fact, it depends uh, only on uh, 
so uh, so in fact it uh, it depends uh, uh, it's less than or equal than uh, I think a constant times uh, p to the power uh, uh, d of x something like this. Uh, so, uh, and, and this is, uh, so let me explain how this works in characteristic two for simplicity. So in this case, uh, we have uh, the semi-simplification uh, is, uh, well, I mean, it has a fiber, for, it's a Tanakian category by our theorem. So it has a, uh, it's a representation category of some linear reductive affine group scheme, G bar. Uh, it's an, in general, a scheme of infinite type because for very simple uh, groups such as Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2, it's already a wild problem to classify in decomposable. So there are lots and lots and lots of them. And uh, this category isn't going to be finally generated. So the group scheme G bar is gonna be in, in inverse limit of uh, group schemes of finite type. So it's gonna be some huge mess, but it does exist. And uh, well, if you want to be less messy, we can take an object X there and look only at the subcategory generated by this object. And that is a representation uh, category of actually some group scheme of finite type linearly reductive. And uh, we know a classification of such group schemes. This is due to Nagata. It's a famous theorem of Nagata, which says that if you have a linearly reductive, uh, a fine group scheme of finite type, uh, uh, then, uh, which means that its representation category is semi-simple, then actually it has the following structure in characteristic two. It's, uh, it has a normal subgroup, which is abelian, and which is a product of a torus with the dual to a finite abelian two group. And, uh, and then uh, a quotient, the quotient is a finite group of odd order, which by the way is always solvable by a theorem of Feit and Thompson. And, so representations of such group, irreducible representations of such a group always have an eigenvector uh, for this abelian subgroup. And therefore their dimension is at most the order of gamma. And, uh, and so this mx actually can be taken to be the order of gamma. Uh, now, Benson conjectured the following, that if G is in fact a two group, not just a finite group, but a group of order, which is a power of two, then this gamma is always trivial. So, so then uh, this would mean that the growth dimension of every indecomposable is one, if, if it has odd dimension. So in other words, if you have an odd dimensional indecomposable, then X tends X dual, contains K as a direct summon, but all the other summons have even dimension. And in fact, even they have dimension divisible by four. So the statement that it has even dimension, which is the weak form of Benson's conjecture is the statement that this group gamma equals one. But uh, we're unfortunately very far from proving that at the moment even though there is a lot of computational evidence, our theorem only implies that there is a finite group gamma here, but so which gives a bound on the dimensions, like I said, but we are still far. And this group may be non-trivial. For example, if you start with a group gamma, you will get the same group gamma. But if your initial group has order a power of two, then the conjecture is that this gamma is trivial, which is this elementary property of representations. Unfortunately, we don't have any idea how to prove this. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Pablo, for the great talk. It's a, you have a very, very strong result. Uh, let me uh, stop recording. Uh,